Um, and with that, I know you're not here to learn about me, but rather to hear from Matt Conger. So I'm going to introduce Matt. Matt is really um, the expert on intelligent building systems with our company. He's been with us for several years, and he's currently responsible for our multi-channel sales strategy for the Southeast and Latin America. Um, and he also works with our C-level sales uh, in the Fortune 500 enterprise clients area as well. So a lot of expertise here. Um, he builds our ecosystem and partner relationships for, so for anyone who might think that the ecosystem's right for them, this is the guy to talk to. Um, he's really leading the charge there. And his past experience in product management, marketing, industrial and systems engineering really means that he brings a lot of different perspectives to really solve today's workplace challenges, which I think, you know, is a great reason why he's a great member of our team. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Matt and we're going to get started. Awesome. Thank you, Kim, for uh, putting this together. And um, thanks audience and or Zoom attendees for, for spending time with me and with Kim and I this afternoon. Um, we are excited to share with you some of our thoughts on selling the value of smart buildings. So let's just uh, let's just dive in. So I always like to start off to talk a little bit about what is my high level description of an intelligent building. And so to me, uh, an intelligent building fosters occupant productivity, health and fulfillment, uh, safety and security, all while maximizing energy savings and um, uh, and minimizing maintenance. So throughout this presentation, I will speak to some of the specific benefits, but as you can see, it's a rather broad or high level description of an intelligent building. I would slight, I usually say that everyone wins with intelligent buildings. So that's whether you are designing, building, operating, or using these structures, everyone kind of has a different kind of benefit that they see. So how does Igor deliver on an intelligent building? Well, what we have is our Nexos software platform. So Nexos is an IoT platform designed to turn the built environment into a future-proof intelligent building. So at Igor, we power and communicate with numerous disparate objects via our edge devices or nodes as shown here. So by placing Igor's edge devices, whether uh, to where the action or activity is, the faster we can move the data around. With the data and connectivity happening in real time, the ability to integrate with other systems or to create new applications are endless. So not only is the information processed quickly, it is done so securely and using a standard-based open protocol, which is IEEE 802.3AT or 802.3BT. So let's jump in and let's, let's take a look at some high-level benefits. So cost is, is always a fun one that people want to talk about. So from a cost perspective, in many cases, the Igor system is comparable or less expensive than traditional AC line voltage. We tend to deliver shorter construction or faster truck construction timelines. We achieve uh, greater energy savings and uh, our POE systems have shown an incremental 22% in energy savings as compared to non-network systems. We minimize maintenance as in that there is a there's no line voltage to deal with, there's less emergency lighting batteries, there's longer life of light fixtures, and there's less AC line voltage drivers. And then also because it is a truly open uh, architecture, it can be integrated with or taken control of by third-party applications. So rather than listen to me rattle on some more, let's hear from one of our recent clients. Um, so Jason is gonna talk here, and it's gonna be about a minute and a half, so I hope, uh, hope we see some value here. I'm Jason. I'm with Music Drive. Um, I've been involved in this building since 2016. We started building um, March or May of 2018. We just finished up on our February. We've been doing um, everything that's analog is pretty much standard building, and then you get into the IT, and that's been the uh, goal of this entire site. Um, I've been involved with every single aspect from you know start to finish, the software versions from. Uh, everything I work has put into it, everything uh, NextGen has put into it has been fantastic. Um, and there's tons of work to see, so hopefully you guys can come by. Switch back to them so you have no conduit in the ceiling. It's all J books with that six So 
the only install time is when the gas is stable from here, home run to the IT room, you're done. Make it pretty, move it up, plug it into a light, plug it into a uh, uh, network, network switch in there and turn it on. So there's no commissioning, there's nothing. It's Now it's a guy sitting on a computer for a few hours. So how much time do you think it actually saves you in construction? It's got to be a month, two months, maybe two and a half. And That's huge. For 405 lights, you have to run conduit from there all the way to every single break. Yeah. Instead, you're just going to so we heard from Jason there talk a little bit about some of the benefits that he's seen, whether it was uh, faster construction timelines, uh, uh, less complexity of the solution. And so um, we'll just continue on with some more benefits that, uh, that we also see. So um, added safety and security, deployment of real-time location services so for things such as wayfinding and mobile asset tracking is something that's been a pretty hot topic as of late. Um, Delivery of white tunable white light, excuse me, tunable white lighting, and/or uh, using lighting to uh, do circadian rhythm, uh, so we can increase productivity, increase health benefits, uh, increase fulfillment, all just through basic lighting things, right? And then uh, the being able to lay, layer on things like our new disinfection automation solution, which you'll hear about in the coming weeks uh, from uh, the marketing team here at Igor. So we could go on for hours uh, just communicating all the different benefits of the platform. At the end of the day, Igor, Igor's platform is a foundation on which new applications are layered upon. So if you have an idea for your building and that uh, it could possibly help solve a problem or make person's lives better, give us a call and let's talk through that example and see if it is uh, something that's layer on or, or deployable in our architecture. So, the ecosystem. So here at Igor, uh, we believe that to, to enable an intelligent building, it takes a village, right? So Igor only makes software and nodes. All the other parts and pieces that are needed to create an intelligent building solution are by others. That is why an ecosystem of hardware and software applications is so important. All the other parts and, um, excuse me, uh, we have a built, we've built a network of ecosystem partners to deliver the measured outcomes to our clients. So Igor has several partners that we work with today, and we will continue to grow and expand over time. Becoming familiar with the ecosystem and the value that it creates is just as important as being able to speak to the Igor platform. So what we'll do now is we're going to take a look at some, just a, a, a sampling of some of our ecosystem partners. So. Volt Server. Volt Server provides digital electricity that uh, moves electricity over distance using class two low voltage cabling. Cohost is a provider of a personal control experience application from your mobile device. LG is an electronics manufacturer, but more specifically, they provide variable refrigerant flow air conditioning along with energy storage uh, via battery technology. Uh, Avani provides network presence sensing along with their real-time location services, and then Cisco provides their PoE network switches. So you might be thinking, why am I just listing off these companies? Well, the reason I do this is because when provided as part of a holistic approach to intelligent building design, you can provide a total install cost for electrical infrastructure that is roughly in line with AC, traditional AC infrastructure, maximizing energy savings and increasing their return on investment and providing a better user experience. If you remove any one of these from the solution, you need you do not get the, the best value and the benefit for the client. So you have to take, be familiar with all these complementary technologies in order to enable intelligent buildings. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about the sales process that we go through. So while traditional sales process steps and methods still apply to the industry, there are still some unique considerations to take into account in order to help improve your chances of success. So during the identification stage, we're looking to find out who those decision makers are. So most of the time we're looking for folks such as the directors of IT, construction, real estate, maintenance, OT, that's kind of our core audience that we spend a lot of our time with. And at this point, we're also trying to understand what is the project scope and what are the client's issues. If the client says they want an intelligent building, then hey, you're in good shape and uh, things should be smooth sailing. But unfortunately, 
there are many times where the potential client is think is not thinking about smart buildings and this is still a very relatively new concept it is important to not solely focus on upfront cost as this is not the most reason why people choose igor today while the total install cost of our solution can be less than traditional infrastructure it does not always hold true many variables such as the complexity of the design local building and energy codes labor rates fixture selection how far along they are in the construction process and more can influence the total and call stops cost installed cost of the project so don't get me wrong though you should still communicate to the client that you know the best way to control the cost and how to lay out the system to deliver the best low the best value uh, at the lowest total installed cost problem um, possible so always keep that in mind during the qualification stage we want to qualify a smart building opportunity that it'll often require you to introduce a new concept to the end user client again it is important that you're not solely focused on upfront cost look for clients that are thinking beyond the delivery or the basic delivery of lighting and energy saving so we don't want to be saying hey we are an alternate means of powering and controlling lighting it's just not that exciting so while it is true that igor delivers the greatest energy savings possible of any system it still ranks lower on the reasons why a client selects Igor. So here we're gonna move into the de developing the solution stage. So here we wanna tailor the solution to the client's needs. Using the Nexos ecosystem, try to provide unique solutions that meet the client's pain points. Find out what the overarching goals are of the client and or try to identify specific changes, challenges that they are facing. Remember, Igor is a platform on which many solutions are built on top of. From there, look at how Igor and other system partners can support the goals or solve the problems they are having. Igor delivers the maximum energy savings and future proofing, but benefits of working and living in the space are the primary focus driving our opportunities today. So this will evolve as the technology continues to be adopted and as, in, and as new applications or solutions are developed around our digital infrastructure. As we move into the collaboration phase, this one is very important. So here we need to be working with the clients, architects, engineers, and or lighting designers. Those are all very important influencers, influencers in the decision-making process. So we've got to make sure that everybody's covered. The best chance of writing a project as an Igor, as Igor POE is to be on the front end of the design process. So when you're doing this on the front end, please be sure to communicate with Igor regularly. We are here to help you to bring your projects forward. And then as we move into the closure phase, so here we want to assist the client in finding a locally qualified installer, match them up with a Bixi certified organization that will hang light fixtures and install other end devices because it's not just about lighting and work with lighting suppliers and make sure everyone understands their role. Uh, ensure the client can receive a total installed, installed cost solution, and then make sure there's a team member working on the project that can commission it, start it up, and then also train the, train the end user client. So after we're done. Um, what else is important? Being involved on the project, the earlier the better. So get involved early. The best chance of writing a project as Igor POE is to be on the front end of the design process. If you are not involved at this phase of the process, um, it's, it's, it's a very difficult undertaking. But if you are, you have roughly an 80% chance or higher um, opportunity of writing this these jobs. If you're not on the front end of the design, there's still an opportunity to convert uh, an end user client, but to the, the chances of closing that does diminish. So if, um, if why does it diminish over time if you're not involved on the front end? Well, it's because at this point, time and money has already been invested in building things like drawing sets or creating lighting and lighting controls designs, laying out the AC electrical infrastructure to support this. And in many cases, a general contractor or even electrical contractor are already in place. If the electrical infrastructure has been designed, but an electrical contractor has not yet been selected, work with a design team to develop an alternate design. Igor will, Igor will support you in this endeavor. The owner really has to want it at this point as additional time and possibly money are gonna be required from them. 
if the electrician has already been selected and they are signed and they've signed a contract, then your chances of closing diminish further. At this point, cost tends to be the primary driver. Conversations with your end user client must be had to describe the process of bidding projects, appropriately designing those projects, and where you can create your value in that process. If the client is willing to invest their time and maybe some funds, then you still have a fighting chance at that point. So let's take a look at a, uh, a K through 12 school example. So here we were able to uh, reach the end user decision makers at the school system. The benefits were communicated to them and they resonated with the client. The client identified some of their initial needs and wants and so we incorporated that into the, the system. At this point, we communicated a rough order of magnitude pricing. Research was also done by the client at this point to reach out to multiple references, other school systems, installation partners, and other past customers to verify that we're able to deliver these benefits. The school system then decided to move forward and engage with their local engineering firm to, to complete a digital infrastructure design. The engineer worked with Igor to ensure that they were following Igor's best practices, and then the drawings were put out to a bid to a qualified installer. A local qualified installer was selected to complete the installation. And so with that, let's listen to uh, what a teacher had to say about um, her system at her school. Uh, this one runs about a minute and a half. My name is Mary Claire Wright, and I'm the computer science teacher here at Davidson High School. How are you using the color changing capabilities to choose the environment that fits your so the Igor panel is right beside my door, and as I move through the classroom, I will just subtly change the lighting depending on what we have going on. When you're teaching high school students, they can listen to a lecture for about seven minutes before their attention starts to wander, and you have to do something to reset their clock. So I use the lights to reset their clock. So I will change it from a high or a low light or a warm or a cool light to subtly change the environment in the room and redirect their attention. And it's worked like a charm. Um, we're able to move much more seamlessly through the material. Um, it's got an AV capability, so when I am projecting, I can hit that button and it will dim the lights right over where I project. Um, so I can still have light in the room, but they're able to see what's on the board. Um, when it was first installed, I thought it was a little frivolous. I wasn't sure what it was for. And if you tried to take it out of my room now, I'd be furious because I can control the mood and the lighting very quickly and we adjust it. I probably adjust it five or six times during class. And I don't know how much the students are aware, but it absolutely impacts. So you heard from Mary Claire Wright on how she uses it every day in her life and how it's made a difference in what productivity, fulfillment, happiness, and that's just through basic lighting controls and integration with AV systems. So with that, we, at the end of the day, we like to focus on how can we make people happier, healthier, safer, and more productive. Uh, if you do that, everybody wins, and, um, and then we create a better place. So with that, my presentation is over, and so I think um, now Kim is going to take over and run the show. Yes, and I am encouraging everyone listening to submit your hard questions. Um, let's challenge Matt and no hard questions. have a couple other slides in the appendix that um, we might be able to pull up to provide a little more context on this. But we're going to start with a really simple one. Um, well, maybe simple, actually. I, shouldn't mm, I, I don't know anything. Uh, I don't know. A little pressure there. Uh, Lester is asking actually back about Volt Server. Yes, does Volt Server power the network switch or can they now connect directly to the node? So yes, Lester, good question. So uh, uh, Volt Server is a great ecosystem partner of ours and they can in fact uh, power a network switch. So imagine you have, um, and typically you have AC power coming to a building, they convert that to digital electricity, they move that over great distances and then convert it back to an AC source where the network switch lives. And that is my very high level uh, description. And so Lester, if you've got an opportunity, let's get you connected with Volt Server and Igor and we'll, let's figure out how to help you with your project. Yeah. All right, so Armando is asking, how would you best position PoE in retrofit applications? 
Ooh, that, that also another great one. So <laughs> they're all going to be good, Matt. Yeah. Okay. All right. So in general, um, I do tend to steer towards new construction or significant renovation when it involves lighting, right? So one of the challenges is a lot of folks still say, hey, what is the what is the return on investment for just the power and control of light, right? And so if you're just dealing with lighting and you do not see the incremental val val benefits of doing making people healthier, increasing security, deploying into our air quality systems, and it's all just about power and control of light. It's hard to compete with the return on uh, investment of just changing from a fluorescent troffer over to an LED AC troffer. So while we can do it just for lighting, it's hard to be as competitive. However, with that said, I'll give an example. So um, we recently completed a school where all we did was inc incorporate safety and security solutions on the application. And so there what we did is we put in a um, color changing beacon, beacon light in every single classroom and every single hallway. We then deployed gunshot detection sensors on this project. And then all that was tied in together with the camera system, some automation events, a mass notification. And so they were able to, once this intelligent system came in, were able to maximize the safety and security um, as a retrofit. So it wasn't like we went in and we tried to replace every single fixture. We added value where it made sense. Great, thank you. So it was, yeah, excellent uh, answer to that question, I think. Um, Rick is asking about, uh, Rick Foster says, right or wrong, we often get the question about cost per square foot of PoE versus AC, generally looking for your thoughts on this. Yeah, another good one. So it's always a, it's always a tough conversation. And, and, and we'll, I'll show you a, uh, an example here in just a second. And I'd like to just introduce it first. It's, and the challenge is, is that when you're thinking about and if it's just, again, PoE lighting versus traditional lighting. Okay, so in traditional lighting, you have the cost of the fixtures, and then you have the cost of pulling that conduit or flex in the 12-3 copper. And a lot of times you can get the electrician to break out those costs. But what he's not actually putting back in there is uh, usually, usually when you're doing those comparisons is the load centers aren't, aren't eliminated. No one's taking into account that smaller bus bars or feeders for the building can be utilized or what's the savings on a generator? So getting a real cost comparison can be difficult. So what we've done there is uh, we basically have put together some examples. So I'm gonna use an example here in just a second where it showed that we were able to deliver to the project's budget, right? And uh, for a K through 12 school example. So here's an example where Igor was selected by the client uh, because the total installed cost per square foot came in between $12 to $15 per square foot. And so in that $12 to $15 per square foot, the Igor trained partner provide uh, labor, cabling, uh, the uh, cable management, the, all the lighting and all the uh, software and the energy management lighting controls like push buttons and, um, and, and sensors and even Bluetooth objects, right? The, then the school system provided the power sourcing equipment, uh, UPSs, and others. And so with that, we're able to show that there was a very cost-effective uh, means of, of, of approaching this project. And so this has been allowed us to be very successful um, multiple times over since then. We have some other studies done in New York where we show that the total installed cost is comparable as well. But the best thing I like to do is point my clients to past wins and, and other references where they could tell them from their mouse what they saw from the total installed cost. Great. Um, all right. We are definitely getting some good questions in. Um, Rajesh is asking about generally, you know, how many installations have we done? And maybe that's not really the focus of this question because I think He's asking a little bit more, um, are there any challenges that we tend to face? So any um, challenges that can still exist? And I think probably challenges yeah. we face are similar to all PoE providers. So maybe your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, the, what it used to be, it was, um, you know, because one of the most obvious 
objects we support are lights, right? It's not everything we do, but it's definitely a very visible object. You look up and they're everywhere. And so it's like, hey, that should be part of this intelligent building system. So we support those. So early on, the pushback was, well, I can't find, my lighting designer can't find the fixtures that he or she wants that's compatible with Igor. Um, we were able to show that we can meet a myriad of styles and shapes and form factors to combat that or get over that. So we've been able to um, basically check that box. Uh, we have an emergency lighting solution, whether it be working with line voltage fixtures or PoE uh, emergency lighting fixtures. So we've got a solution for that. So we've been able to, to check those boxes. The things that, that I like to encourage in a project to help combat challenges is you've got to drive and own the project, right? And what I mean by that is you want to influence the design. So you need to say, hey, number one is that we need to abide by Igor's best practice guidelines. And those best practice guidelines have to do with maximizing the amount of wattage we use, max using um, the 802.3 BT standard, how to do the appropriate number of fixtures per run, um, how to eliminate accessory devices, and then, and then taking it from there and then educating the, or working with the electrical engineer on the job to say, hey, um, what we wanna do is we wanna segregate all the low voltage systems away from any line voltage system. And so those, every, those are on two separate, totally different sheets. And in some cases, uh, totally different sections of the bid docs, right? And so the idea there is we want a lot of different installer bases to be able to bid and do the work of installing low voltage systems. And so that's why we had to have it break it out. And then the next thing we try to work with a client on is, and it can be a challenge, is how to procure your, your power sourcing equipment, right? So usually what we'll do is we encourage our end users to procure those goods just like they would through their normal processes. The, what they're used to doing today, just keep doing that. And then we can match up the systems. Sometimes the clients say, no, Matt, we trust Igor. We want a total package from you guys. So then we'll bundle it all together and put it together for them. So we try to be flexible. And, um, but if you abide by our general guidelines for best practices, that's how we can ensure the lowest total installed cost and the client getting the best benefit. Great. Um, Sean is asking, how can the customer be protected from fines or penalty fees from local energy companies for no longer drawing as much power as they used to? Hmm. Um, our, and, and I apologize. I'm, I think I understand the question. So if, if there's Sean, a Sean, if you want to comment, you can clarify that as well if you have any yeah, so our system is DLC listed, right, Kim? Mm -hmm, um, it is, so, yep. We were the yes, first PoE system in the U.S. to be DLC listed. Got it. So as long as your local utility is offering benefits for one, and, and I know we talk about a lot, LED lighting, there's benefits there. But then mm -hmm. two, uh, if they have a DLC for, for network systems, right, we're also in there. And so um, as long as you do those two things on the front end, you'll be good to go, but maybe I might be misinterpreting your question. All right. I'll encourage Sean, if we didn't answer your question, to maybe write, uh, write another one that we can follow up on. Cool. Uh, Thanks, Sean. So we're with Jose, and he is asking about residential installations. What's mm -hmm. about experiences? What experiences do you have about residential installations? And what about integrations with Crestron or AMX automation systems? Ah, cool. Okay, Jose. So we have a Two questions there. So, mm -hmm. um, residential and then the internet. Yeah. So from a residential standpoint, not a ton, right? And the reason that is we've been primarily focused on our larger enterprise opportunities and commercial opportunities. With that said, we do have a really wonderful solution to tackle multi-dwelling unit, dwelling unit housing and to deliver a better experience. So as long as that multi-dwelling using housing desires things like better health, health outcomes or personal control of their spaces, or intelligent services or premium services, then we can deliver a pretty good cost to benefit analysis for MDU. For single family home, it's a little harder. Don't get me wrong, I've put together some packages recently for single family, but it's been pretty much very high end, high -end properties where we're doing like color changing everywhere, right? Um, and then the second part of your question had to do with our ability to integrate with other systems. So 
um, like remember we mentioned the ecosystem earlier, one of our ecosystem partners called T3 Automation and T3 Automation wrote a driver that allows the Crestron C3 processor to control Igor via our API, right? So what would happen is the, uh, the integrator that is familiar with Crestron would procure that driver from T3, load it on that C3 processor, point that processor at the Igor's processor or IP address, and then it will then match up with the JSON web tokens to hit our API. And so Crestron can control a lot of the functions within our system. All right, um, I'm just gonna follow up here. Sean did say, um, so he said no problem, but he's heard of automation projects where the companies were fined for no longer drawing off the grid like they used to. Is that accurate? I'm not sure we've heard that. So I have, um, there is, here I'll use um, uh, Farouk at the Sinclair Properties in Fort Worth, Texas. He was, actually find for or at least excuse me i if i'm recollecting correctly i don't want to spread misrumors or mistruths if i remember correctly he was um issued a fine for a period of time for not drawing enough power but i don't remember the resolution to his challenge so what i can do sean though is i can i can follow up with you after this and get you a more complete answer all right, um, we're back to a question from Lester. So he's asking, electrical contractors have been our greatest barrier when bidding jobs. Do you recommend that bids on POE be done according to Division 27 rather than Division 26? Any other recommendations to ensure that we get appropriate low voltage bids? Sure, Lester, another good one. Um, at the end of the day, all contractors are our friends. So in I would say the bulk of our implementations in North America to date have been by line voltage electricians, right? And usually what they'll do, usually and this does, you know, is they'll sub it to a low voltage team member um, is what will happen most of the time. And so um, a lot of our jobs go through that way. And there are also those jobs are usually included in sections. What used to be 16 is now 26. Here recently, we've seen a number of specifiers move uh, the PoE lighting to the low voltage uh, PoE sheet. And so they're moving it over to section 27. Um, all I would do is I encourage that no matter who's installing it, one, that they have a Bixi certified team members on staff doing the work, especially pulling the cabling, building the, the jacks and building the racks. Then on top of that, I would also encourage any jobs that are designed, whether it's in 26 or 27, you've got to segregate your low from your line voltage. And if you do any and all of those things, everybody will win. Thank you. Uh, James is asking, how much time should be spent educating the local AHJ before they see the drawing to approve? Tough one. So uh, HJs are very important, yeah. right? They, have a, they, they swing a big stick. And um, depending on the market and the opportunity, um, they may or may not be more involved. So our larger projects, we tend to engage them early on. Sometimes they're smaller projects where we just haven't had the time to do it and it'll just go right through. Um, in, in bulk uh, across, and this, this is a very North American specific answer, like we've seen more um, challenges with HJ in markets like Houston, New York, and Chicago. Everywhere else, it has been everything we do is 100% approved. And so those specific markets, um, and I'll use New York as an example. Um, New York, we're still working with uh, local AHJs about the power and control of emergency lighting versus other markets have not been an issue. So I'd say, um, it's, you know, it's better to be safe than just engage them. Um, and as long as you can point out that this is a um, installed by licensed technicians and it is a UL approved system, then you should be good to go. Okay. So how does Igor position the Nexos platform with end user customers that are considering a Johnson controls or other BAS systems? I, I like that one. And who's that one from? That's from Kirk. Okay, Kirk. All right, cool. Good one. Um, so 
when I said uh, an intelligent building takes a village, it really does. So Igor is not is not does not take place of 100% of all the building management system functions. So if I'm and and I apologize, I don't work for Johnson Controls, but one of the most popular things that a BMS expert would provide are HVA systems and HVA system controls. So while Igor does some HVAC controls, like so for example, we deploy thermostats and temperature sensors and we can tell rooftop units or or um, very refrigerant flow air conditioning systems to respond to our commands, right? And then collect that information back. Um, we don't necessarily do chiller management, right? Um, or we're not gonna have um, a, a screenshot of showing the, the 40 RTU units across the ceiling and what they're currently operating at. So there's still a place for the BMS guys. And so what we would say is, hey, we work together with them, either one, we can be on top of them and layer them underneath us. Two, we can operate side by side. Or three, we are a layer underneath the BMS system. So a lot of times the BMS guys, they wanna sell an, um, a sexy graphical user interface and it, it's got your key performance indicators on that. Can we do that? Yes. Um, but we'd rather let like uh, those guys that wanna make those KPI dashboards do their thing and we'd be glad to, to feed our information into those, uh, to their inputs. Thank you. So I would say try to engage them mm -hmm. and add them to your ecosystem. That's what I would do. Fantastic. Okay. So Scott is asking, and it's similar to Rick's question earlier, how about cost savings per port on a network switch versus AC? I don't have an, a perfect answer. Or do on you that. have like an idea of cost per so target? The, the, the deal is the reason why we leverage the 90 watt as much as possible is we want to get as many lumens in it and it's all back to lighting again, right? We want to get as many lumens per watt. And so if I can maximize those runs, um, then I can get to um, a better uh, per port cost, right? Or per port cost per light. But do I have something that says, here's what the port costs? I, I don't have that and I apologize. It's something that we are working to get that exact information, or I bet some of our ecosystem of friends have that. Great. Um, let's see. So are there, Rajesh is asking, are there any tips or tricks to counter wireless solutions? So um, I would say that, um, you know, we can work with wireless systems, right? They can easily be part of our ecosystem. Um, if, if I'm out there talking about however Ethernet is a, is a backbone um, and use leveraging Ethernet cabling, uh, I am usually talking about one is that with a power over Ethernet backbone, I can deliver the closest thing to real time possible. And I can move that data faster than anything else. And I can move it more securely than anything else. And I can do so with an open protocol, right? And so those would be the things that I would say if I was being asked to compete with a wireless, but sometimes the question I'll say is, well, why don't we just work with those guys to help them back, to help them move their information around, right? So maybe it's PoE into the room and then wireless once it's in the room for certain objects. Not, and um, so there is ways to work with them or to, to, if you have to sell against it, you can do so in that manner. All right, um, let's see, does the solution, this is by, from Kutlu, does the solution have any relation or interaction with sustainability, sustainability lead certifications? Um, so I know we would get points towards lead. I don't think, and I apologize, I'm not, um, not lead certified. So I know we contribute towards points towards lead, but I don't know if there's a particular category in lead that says PUE digital infrastructure, right? Um, so that's what I got. All right, and I'm gonna throw a few of these questions that might not be specifically about selling to you, but just to see if you're able to help clarify a little bit. Okay. Asking, have you developed a node that can power more than 48 volt? So, we're 12 to 48 volts DC on our constant current nodes up to like, I think it's 1.8 amps, if I remember correctly. Um, then 
we have our, um, we are working on our constant voltage node that'll be five, you'll be able to set it from between five and 24 volts DC. Um, but I don't, I think we can pass PoE power. I know we can pass it on it. We have a secondary port that passes 24 volts, but I'm not sure we have one that passes greater than 40 volt, 48 volts DC. So what I'd say to you here is that either I know we can solve that problem or one of our friends can solve that problem. Like, uh, like one of our ecosystem partners is called PoE Texas. They've got some awesome tools and, and uh, uh, widgets that can, that can help you. But if you have an idea, give me a call or give Kim a call and let us know what it is you're thinking and then we can see how we can help. Great, okay, so this is from James. I think it's fun. Um, what are some unexpected devices you have provided controlled power for that has delighted the customer? That's delighted the customer. Um, well, I do know that motorized shades is exciting and it, it is fun to watch it, like especially if you're into like um, Cedia or AV type stuff or, um, or home entertainment. It is really fun to, to see people see motorized shades and so I find that is a delightful um, when we tell them that we can do magnetic door strikes, right, and we can lock and unlock doors, that one they get excited about. Um, probably the, the other coolest one, or there's two things that I, li I like a lot. And one, I'm not going to steal it because it's Kim's Thunder for in here in a couple of weeks, which is our disinfection solution. And then, uh, right, Kim? And then... Um, it's very exciting. And yeah, I'll, and I'll share a little bit at the end about what um, you guys should look out for from us. Yeah. And then another one is, um, so there's a company called, called Xander that makes a resting heartbeat and resting breathing sensor. And so literally with, via radar, they can determine like what's your, your current, how you're sleeping, what's your health status. That one's been really cool uh, for certain audiences, so. Yeah, yeah, there's, I think what's been fun from my point of view and I, you know, is to see, how when there's a problem, we can usually find someone who can be a part of our ecosystem and it works with our solution. And that's sort of a benefit of PoE being such a universal standard and then us focusing on that open platform as a software. We're not trying to sell hardware. Um, so we don't have it to sell you a specific brand. You know, we can really help you find the right value for the customer. So yeah, exciting. Um, all right, let's see if there's some other. Okay, Rick is asking, do you see any trends regarding faster adoption by given market segments, such as schools, commercial spaces, or healthcare, and so on? It's pretty spread out, right? Uh, we do a lot of commercial office space. That's been, and it's, and it's yeah, globally, um, been very attractive. Um, we were starting to see very, very, very good penetration in the hospitality space. And so, um, that's been like really fast growth rate, but I have a little bit of concern with the COVID and the state of the economy on where that might end up. Um, K through 12 schools is hot, right? It's a very, it, you, it's, it's a good, they have a very targeted audience to reach, a very good message and benefit and cost story. And so they've been of great interest. And on the healthcare side, senior living uh, is, a, is a hot one uh, too. So it's, I don't know, it's kind of spread out, Kim. I don't know, do you have a, what's your feel? Or you, you think there's any one thing that, that's hot? I mean, commercial, commercial <laughs> office has been the biggest though. Yeah, and I think even with everything going on, commercial offices will still be big. From a marketing perspective, the messaging has changed in three months from how many people can you fit in an office to yeah. how you make people safe in an office. And it's very different, but there's still the solution and having something flexible that's POE based is a great way to make sure you can, and so we can adapt because we can just pick different partners and, and build that on our solution. So that's exciting. Um, I think education has yeah. been very interesting because there's definitely a security element in the US in particular that um, plays well. But then there's the, the teachers care about the in classroom experience and how much even simple, simply just lighting can make a difference. And with everything going on, um, as we're developing this disinfection solution that we're going to launch on the 1st of June, um, it's really appeals to all of these different markets. So um, just as a, a foreshadowing, we're gonna be having a full webinar to really explain what this is um, on June 4th. 
So you'll, you'll have to look for a message from us to sign up for that. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there's a few kind of, okay, so one, uh, they're asking about where to find this, this T3 that was mentioned for the Crestron. <laughs> I promise, Matt, I'm going to get that info from you. We'll just include that as a little line in our um, follow-up email. All right, cool. First. Um, and then, let's see. So James is asking, Igor has a five-year warranty on hardware. Is it wise for installation contractors to include labor in a five-year warranty? I never see it. It's every contractor, every contract I've seen at the general contractor, EC or low voltage contractor level has been a one year on parts and labor. Um, what it could be if, if let's say you wanted to move beyond just doing installation and you wanted to become the, uh, the IOT advisor or the trusted advisor for that, for that client, there are opportunities to sell them SaaS based products. So SaaS based products or, or software as a service. So clients are willing to pay SaaS models for, for service, right? Or for guaranteed energy savings, mm -hmm. or they're willing to pay for real-time location services, um, safety and security, mm -hmm. and then uh, health benefits. So there are opportunities to transition from that, that one and done to a continuous uh, revenue stream. Yeah. And, and the SaaS model is important, actually, when it comes to securing facilities. You know, you don't really want free software that doesn't have a recurring support benefit or something because who is being paid to protect that software? Yeah, right. But, you know, there's been a shift where in the lighting industry, I know you face this, when it's just POE lighting, it's difficult for the SaaS model to work because it's a one-time purchase, and that's what the industry is used to. That's why selling that value of the smart building that you've described is so important because not only does it help create better spaces and provide more value, people understand that it requires a SaaS model. And then that's something that more people can benefit in there. Um, and it, it's just good business practice. You know, I, I don't want companies I depend on for the security of my building to go out of business because they don't have that recurring revenue. I want them to be supported, so. Absolutely, it's, it's definitely a shift in thought a process around, mm -hmm. around safety and security. So yeah, that's, that's a great point, Kim. And you know, I'm not, Sean's asking a question, I kind of saw that, you know, he's asking about what network protection is in place to prevent cyber attacks on the building. Is it provided by the installer or the customer to source their own? Um, and I will say, you know, we've, we've had some webinars already where there might be people who are better equipped uh, to answer this because that might get a little technical, but generally what are your thoughts on the cybersecurity element, Matt? Yeah, usually we always recommend to set up a VLAN no matter what, and that's uh, your most basic level of protection. Um, two, some customers just build a entirely segregated network that's for IoT. Um, right, so it doesn't even ever touch the other systems, even with a VLAN. So there are there are ways to do it uh, safely, and I would have to. But what I usually do is when we get to the security detailed security questions beyond like talking about VLANs, I bring in um, our director of operate, or excuse me, our VP of operations to uh, speak to his, the the security of the system, and then um, his background on what we do. And we're kind of wrapping up. There's still a few questions. I think we can tackle them here. Um, certainly, if you still have a question that's lingering, feel free to submit that. Um, but we will be wrapping up right around one as well. So we've got about 10 minutes to, to finish up what we've got here. Um, so James has a question here. For the latest energy codes and more stringent states and cities, do you have presets that can help sell the idea on Igor? So we do meet and exceed every energy code uh, here in, in the North America, U.S. and North America. So whether it's IECC or ASHRAE or a state-specific one, we meet and exceed those. Then do we have like preset little packages? Not so much. Um, can we do all of them? Yes. And, and it's, a, it's a function of the commissioning process. So what we'll do is uh, in, a, in a design job, the specifier or us will say, hey, this must meet or exceed whatever the local code is. And then sometimes we'll take it a step further and we'll write out what is the required or desired sequence of operation by space. And then once the system is installed 
uh, during the commissioning process, that is when those, those, logic, um, those logic things or, or, or action sets are set up for those faces. Kirk is asking, do Igor clients ever re request 36 to 60 month lease financing for the lighting system? I've only run into it one time. I would love to run into it more often. Um, selling lighting as a service has been difficult mm -hmm. in my opinion, but maybe I'm going about it the wrong way. Yeah. Um, let's see, Ramkey is on and he's asking, um, and this might be sort of like an add some additional thoughts here. Um, how do you compare your system versus wireless IoT slash lighting system? So we sort of touched on that earlier, but did you have a little more um, on how you might do a comparison or? So, okay, so, um, and again, I don't like to, you know, I'm not here to like bash other technologies or anything. Um, but what I would say is, um, so if I was building a new building, right? and I wanted um, intelligent data collection or intelligent control and visibility of devices. So why would you pull an analog infrastructure in 12.3 copper in, in flexible conduit or rigid conduit and then put a wirelessly communicating device on the other end of it? Um, it it's like, I don't know, uh, putting a horse in front of a Tesla almost is the way I look at it. So you, you're not you just, why not, if you're going to build a building, what's the best way to build a building? Well, that's to just leverage low voltage cabling, right? And so that would be what I would say there. Um, and I think that's what's right today. And in the longer term, you know, I could see um, the, the market going from line voltage AC cable to low voltage DC cable and then wirelessly communicating devices in the space. And I think that's great um, if you're just doing energy management lighting controls. If you are into safety and security, real-time location services, indoor air quality, um, safety and security applications, then you definitely want to have PoE backhaul, PoE data communication for its reliability and its security and its speed and then maybe supplement with some wireless in the space if it's needed, right, is a retrofit. But if I'm doing new construction or significant renovation, that level, just leverage that low voltage infrastructure so that you don't need uh, batteries or so that you don't need or risk um, uh, batter, you know, battery free devices going down and having to be recommissioned. It's very hard to reflash those devices quickly uh, versus just leveraging PoE. So that's just, those are my thoughts. Um, yeah, that's what I got. Perfect. Um, a couple of remaining ones, and then we're going to call it a day. Um, James is asking, what percentage of the jobs are able to hold circadian color changing through the value engineering phase? Yeah, um, not much. So if I'm, um, once you've convinced a client to go PoE, right? That's a bit, that's the big chunk. So the cost adder to go from PoE white light to PoE tunable white light is only like three to 5% adder. So if the client, usually what happens is once we've gone all in on PR or ethernet, people start to, they, 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 let's say they look at the numbers and they're like, wow, I need to shave some money. So our first step as a value engineer is um, normally when we start a design, the Igor node is either is typically embedded or connected to a fixture, a one-to-one -one ratio for devices that are 25 watts or more. If they're lower than 25 watts, then we'll use two, one Igor node to power and control two fixtures or four fixtures or however many fixtures. So we start there. Then if the client's like, wow, I have to shave some money off, well, the, um, then we can shave off and we go to a remote node concept where if I have two 25 watt fixtures in a 60 watt port, I can put two 25 watt fixtures on one Igor node. Or if I have two 40 watt fixtures, I can take two 40 watt fixtures and connect in a 90 watt port, I can connect two of those to one node and get the cost savings. But when you do that from going from an integral node to an external node, Tunable white and circadian rhythm, it requires two, at least two channels per fixture. So now you're talking about pulling more channels. And so that's when it sometimes gets pulled out is uh, when you go through that kind of process. So it's, it's, I always lead with tunable white because I'm like, once you go POE, it's like a no brainer. It's like three to 5%. 
And then depending on where the project goes from there, then that's how we'll, that's how we will fight that fight. Ine is wondering, how much are you involved in writing controls narratives for a project? Uh, it, it, everyone varies. So uh, David Kane runs our, our, our quotes and our design team. And uh, I can tell you that there's not a single day that's the same for that man uh, and, and for the, and the folks that he works with. So I would say that um, usually we'll, we'll communicate verbally or we'll give a client an example of past, uh, past examples. And then the, then the engineer record will then put that on their plans. And then occasionally we do write those, write those with, in conjunction with the engineer. We do want to make sure that the engineer is taking some ownership on that though. And then final question of the day is from James again. He is asking if you can misconfigure a system to break the laws of the energy codes. Can you lock them down to satisfy cranky authorities having jurisdiction? So with any system, you can break things, right? And so what I like to say is that once an Igor system is deployed, right? And if, if it, um, you know, it's, you can say this is always a vacancy sensor. It'll be nothing more than a vacancy sensor. Um, and, and so that is done in software, right? So it is possible to lock it out to where the end user cannot change things. Um, but then if you do know how, let's, there, there's ways, not ways, but um, you can reprogram a device via software if you have all the training in the world to do so. So there's always a way around everything, but in general, it does, we do meet the requirement to say, hey, someone can't change this in the field. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for your time today. Did you have any final thoughts on selling the value of POE-based smart buildings you wanna leave um, with the audience here? Just if you have, your ideas and you want to talk about it, give us a call, shoot us an email. Um, if you got a project where you want to pitch it on, let's, let's, let's try something together. We're here to help you. We're here to help you grow this market. And um, so just uh, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. And Kim, thank you for hosting. Wonderful. Well, we will have um, a follow-up email with a lot of this information and some of the things we talked about today in there. And um, certainly, you know, I think the takeaway for me, is that there's there's so much value that as long as the cost of the system is in line with a client's budget, you know, we might not be the cheapest every time, but the value can be so much more. And I Absolutely. know from a marketing point of view, I often will ask the projects and clients, like, why did you pick Igor? The first thing is basically never cost. It is always a different value-based option, like a uh, security or the tunable lights or something about value followed by, of course, you know, we were certainly within their budget. So um, I think that can make it challenging. There's not clear answers right now. The industry is still kind of new, but we're trying. Um, and value is really what seems to, to help us um, make a lot of headway in the market. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, we're going to say uh, we're going to end it today and uh, take care and Hopefully we'll see you at the next one and then again in June.